that's two quarters, two quarter waters. The New York Times, you need a bag for that. The tax is added. Once you get some practice at it, you do rapid mathematics automatically. Selling maxi pads, fuzzy dice for taxi cabs. Practically everybody's stressed, yes, but they press through the mess, bounce checks, and wonder what's next in the heights. Hey, everybody, welcome to Show People. Our guest this week is Lin Manuel Miranda, the Tony Award winning uh, composer and star. Of in the Heights. How, how you doing, Len? I am good. Congrats on your new venture. Thank you very much. Now I went back to In the Heights last night, the first time in a long time, and it's in amazing shape. First of all, thanks. Yeah, we what? wanted to stick the landing on this mother. <laughs> <laughs> you are back in the show in the lead role after. I mean, you took like over a year and a half off, yeah. right? And then you went on the road for a little bit, and now you're back in New York. Yeah. So, so how's it feel to be back in the hood? It feels amazing. Um, I forgot how good it feels. Um, you know, I did the show in LA and I did the show in Puerto Rico and those were both fantastic on their own terms. Those are 2,300 seat theaters uh, in both those spots. Right. So you learned, I learned to perform Usnavi into sort of this void of darkness and I forgot how intimate the Richard Rogers is. I can right. see everyone's face and as Usnavi I have permission to talk to everyone. So I can kind of keep track of how they're dealing with the story and it's like I've invited them all in my living room and uh, it's a really wonderful feeling. And also to come back, like, all the super fans are back. Like, right. that girl who made the animated blackout video, she was on the aisle last night. <laughs> She's next to super fan Sam, who's seen it 23 times. So it really is, um, it's been this amazing communal experience these last few shows. Now, I know that you're working on a movie version. Do you think this is the last time you'll actually do the character on stage? Because I was thinking about it, and... There's no reason why Usnavi can't be an old dude. I mean, you could be doing this for the rest of your life. Right? <laughs> I could Kathy Rigby this thing forever. Um, <laughs> you know, I uh, I think it's that's it for me. I I, I don't want to. Um, I'll do the movie if if we get the movie done. Hopefully, you know, we're shooting this uh, spring summer. We're on schedule to do that. Wow. Um, and uh, and then that'll be that'll be it for Usnavi for me. And then I'll come back as the dad in the second revival, and that will be fun. <laughs> I'm just writing myself parts. I'm working on an abuelo character for the third revival, so I can just stay employed every 20 years or so. <laughs> so the show is closing yeah. uh, January 9th, and it's been obviously an amazing journey. And if you think about you, I mean, you were just some dude, right, three years ago? I remain some dude. <laughs> I'm just some dude who wrote a show. Um, and now you're, you know, you're taking Hollywood meetings. You have a Tony. J Jennifer Lopez knows who you are. <laughs> You danced with her. I saw the photos. I did. I danced with Jennifer Lopez. And I thought I was so cool when I was dancing with her. It was at her birthday party. And someone showed me a picture of me dancing with her. My face is like this. Like, it's amazing how uncool I looked what, 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 versus how I looked in my What head. other face should you make when that moment's happening? This is what I'm saying. That's a bucket list <laughs> moment, right? Um, but no, it's, you know, my life is, is pretty much the same other than the fact that I'm, like, married. Uh, everything is the same. I'm... Uh, you know, I'm just continuing to write. I just feel really lucky that I get, you know, that I get to do what I love as my day job, like poop around and make up songs. That's, that's a really good life. It, my first job was working at McDonald's, and this is better. I was going to ask, did you have crappy jobs while you I were... had terrible jobs. I, well, I had some really great jobs, and I had some really, like, okay, that made rent jobs. For many years, I was... I taught after school programs. I danced at bar mitzvahs. They'd hired you to dance at a bar mitzvah? Yeah, there are... There is a certain type of bar mitzvah out in Long Island in the greater Scarsdale area where they just hire guys to be like in black satin shirts and be like, hey, kids, get on the dance floor. And <laughs> I have left most of my dignity at those bar mitzvahs in the greater Scarsdale area. <laughs> so writing the movie, if you have this distance now, did, did that, I'm wondering if that distance from the show maybe helped you think about how to turn this into a movie. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, distance is an underappreciated part of the creative process. I think being away from it, not be doing the show every night, uh, really helps us see how we can make the best movie possible, not just the best adaptation of a stage musical, because sometimes that happens. They show up intact and they're just dead on screen. So it's a real needle to thread. Well, have you, you must be thinking about that a lot, because obviously in the last 20 years, a lot of Broadway shows have become movies. Some of them successful, some of them not successful yeah. at all. So what do you think makes, makes, makes a musical work on screen? I think, um, well, I think the first step is a, is a good director, and I think we have that in Kenny Ortega, and I'm excited about that. Why is he the right guy? 
Uh, well, one, I didn't even realize he was choreographing my entire childhood, but he was. But you look at his credits, I mean, they include Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Dirty Dancing and, uh, and Newsies, which, you know, me and my dad were like the three guys who, the three guys, the two guys who saw that uh, in the theater. <laughs> now it's gotten this whole huge cult following, and I hear it's coming back in the stage version. Yeah. I love that movie. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I was, I was a big fan of his work. And so I think, I think he knows how to tell stories with music on screen, and that's really hard to do. So, and, and also, you know, with his Latino background, he has a real connection um, to this material uh, in a really, in the guts way. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to see what he does with it. So which of these, back to the, the movie, the musicals that did make it, can you think of what, some of the recent movie musicals, which did you like? Um, let's see, I really liked, um, well, Chicago, I think, is like the gold yeah. standard. I think that was such an incredible uh, adaptation. Well, Chicago was able to sort of get away with this dream sequence concept. Right. And that, that was sort of a, a gimmick that worked beautifully. Yeah. Well, it's material. not a gimmick in their movie. It's, it just right. is how they tell their story, right. and it's wonderful. And you have now since seen it used as a gimmick in, in subsequent films. So it's like, right. let's Chicago it. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> right. it's when the innovation becomes uh, the template. Right. Um, but, you, but you didn't, the audience didn't have to buy much of people bursting, bursting into, into song, song because of that. Right, right. So obviously. I'm trying to think, uh, an example of one that I think works very well, also Sweeney Todd. I love Tim Burton's adaptation too, of that. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I heard they were snipping the chorus, I was like, they're snipping the chorus! Um, they but it works, it works really well. I mean, it just goes right into it and you buy it from the second it starts. Do you think you will have movie stars in it? I don't know, I, you know, um, we're not at, we're literally on budget land, which is the boring answer I give everyone, but it's, yeah. it happens to be the true one. We're right. trying to figure out what our budget is. Um, and I think it will be a mix of uh, you know, faces that make the studio happy and faces that you've never, that afford us those people you've never heard of that we can make into stars. Okay. Um, you know, like Hairspray is a fantastic example. Right. Of, you know, for John Travolta, you have the guy who played Seaweed who was unbelievable yeah. and walks off with the movie. And you can be writing new songs so that you can get an Oscar nomination. <laughs> I, I've written a new song not to get an Oscar nomination because I found a moment for a new song. Um, Do you want to share that? Uh, exclusive news of what the moment is. No, because it might get cut by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> We're way too early in the game. Right. You're definitely being open to cutting things and writing new things. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely. Great. I, I, I know that the two and a half hour version on stage will be great for fans of the show, but that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily make a great movie. So right. we're, we're committed to that. So here's what I was wondering. You're kind of like a video game freak. Yeah. And every hit movie has a video game. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think that In the Heights video game could be? Oh, that's a fantastic. <laughs> well, you know, what would be cool is, and now I'm going to get really geeky video game, like an open world game. Because I'm not a big fan of, unless it's Super Mario Brothers, like something really just classic and old school. Right. I like the games where you can kind of go around and do anything, like uh -huh. your Red Dead Redemptions, your Grand Theft Autos. Um, so it would be cool if we had like a photorealistic Washington Heights and, you know, there was bursting into song and there were tasks, but you could also just kind of go to the salon. And hang. Um, that's the fun of those of those Grand Theft Auto games. You can do whatever you want, right. and you know it'll be a little more violent because uh, video game. You know, in the Heights is is decidedly not violent, but it would be fun to shoot people in the face because it's a video game. And that's what you do. <laughs> so I want to ask you quickly about West Side Story. Shoot. You wrote Spanish lyrics yeah. to some very well loved songs, and critics didn't know what to do with it, and audiences right. didn't know what to do with it, and they, and they ended up being taken out of the show. Yeah. What was that whole experience like for you? I've never heard you talk about it. Well, for me, it was an awesome experience. Because yeah. Sondheim was awesome. Steve was like, use whatever images you want, make sure it rhymes in the same places, because that's what my ear is going to be checking for. Right. And as long as you do that, I don't care what you do. Go, wow. go crazy. So, you know, he was very... Um, He's very giving in terms of what he allowed me to adapt. And then I just locked myself in a room with my dad and three thesauri, uh, and we got to write lyrics to this immortal music. Um, and, and the real fun for me in that project was my father seeing what a craft this is, that this is not just sort of this thing my son does that's easy. You know, he would, we'd be translating the, the quintet into Spanish, and that was like a killer because we were trying to rhyme English with Spanish. Yeah. So it's, we're going to cut them down to size tonight. Okay. We have to find a word in Spanish that rhymes with size. Wow. And dun, 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 dun. and we have eight syllables. <laughs> um, the last one being ice. And my dad would give a suggestion. And I'd be, that's, that's great, Dad, but that's 25 syllables and we have eight. <laughs> and so I remember my mom telling me just, you know, your dad is like up late going, 
That's hilarious. What a bonding moment. Yeah, so it was a really, that, it was a real bonding moment for us. And then, you know, the subsequent uh, reaction to it um, w was interesting. West Side Story is a classic, and West Side Story is pretty perfect. Mm -hmm. So people were like, why can't I hear the show? <laughs> the way I heard it as a kid, the way I did it in high school. Um, and so there was real pushback from the audience and the producers felt real pressure to change a lot of it back and they did. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't take away from my experience. I got to work with Sondheim, Lawrence and my pops. It's amazing. Yeah. Now you talk about your dad. Your dad uh, um, became very famous this year also. I did, as did of, my father-in-law. <laughs> because of this video that you put on YouTube from your wedding. Of you my dad's an Israeli superstar. <laughs> that has, Almost 2.2 million views, which I did the math. That's way more people than have seen in, than have seen in the Heights. I easily, mean, yeah. Easily. My legacy will be the guy who surprised <laughs> his wife with Lahaim. And you surprised with this song from Fiddler on the Roof, and uh, she knew nothing. Vanessa knew nothing about no. this. No, we really surprised the hell out of her. And you rehearsed with. Your, yeah. your father, your father-in-law, uh, the wedding party. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you want to hear the the lowdown of how it came together, it was really quite a. Uh, a thing, I was doing the show in LA and I got flash mobbed. Like I got yeah, surprise I flash mobbed. I thought that on YouTube also. And that was crazy. Um, and then I was getting ready to do one of the shows. I was on the treadmill, I had the iPod on shuffle and Lahayam popped up because wow. I have Fiddler on my iPod. Yeah, I said it. But you know, I, w I was you know, getting married in two months and I was listening to the song and I said, this is like the only father-in-law, son-in-law song that exists. Right. I, can't, I can't think of another one, at least not one within the musical theater canon. Um, and I said, we should do this. And it also has an incredible build and I was in a flash mob state of mind. <laughs> and, um, and so I emailed uh, the entire wedding party and said, let's do this. And uh, wow. you know, my, my father-in-law is a generous soul and it has an incredible voice, um, sang, in, sang doo-wop uh, in his youth. Uh, so he was, he was on board and um, we rehearsed for a month. We would rehearse at his house and, and Bring It On was always my cover. Um, thankfully, you know, Andy calls a lot of meetings, so I was like, oh, Andy called me with another meeting. I gotta go downtown, and then we'd rehearse uh, uh, at Lahayim, and uh, it just went so much better than I even expected. And it's been, uh, it's been really wonderful. And one of the most wonderful things about that, actually, was um, I got uh, three beautiful emails from uh, Jerry Bach, Joe Stein, and Sheldon Harnick uh, before uh, Jerry and Joe yeah. passed. Um, and they, sent, they were very moved by that, that I included that at my wedding, and that was very meaningful to me to get letters from them. Yeah, that's epic. Yeah, it was, it was epic. And Joe Stein's was the best. It said, uh, said P.S., who cast the in-laws? They were perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I miss him. Now, you mentioned Bring It On. Yeah. We have to talk about Bring It On. Everyone's excited about this. Yeah. It's, it's in rehearsals. It starts January 15th. It is. I think at, they're going into tech right now. At the Alliance yeah. Theater in Atlanta. Yes. So uh, why Bring It On? Because Andy asked. Andy Blank and Bueller. <laughs> Andy Blank and Bueller asked, and he heights. said, they're giving me the rights to the Bring It On franchise. Do you wow. want to do it? And I said, I don't know anything about cheerleaders. We even have a football team at Hunter. Basically, Bring It On is about um, a white high school cheer group and a black high school cheer group from Com East Compton. Well, that's the, what the original movie that's is what the about. the movie is about. This is Jeff Witte's entirely new plot so and not, entirely okay. new oh, brainchild. So it's not, it's not it's that. It's not based on the original film or oh. any of the films in the franchise. Uh, you know, Jeff, very rightly so, was like, whenever I see a movie adaptation, I'm waiting for those scenes from the movie to happen. Right. And it just kills any suspense. So he's written an entirely new plot that's just sort of set in well, that's that world. That's refreshing. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's closer to All About Eve than Bring It On. So how are you feeling entering this final Net final week of In the Heights. I feel First of all, everyone should go see it. If, if you saw it before, yeah. or you should try to get in because it's in, it's in great shape. It's also, it's the energy of people who are really savoring every minute on stage. Um, and, uh, and that's wild. It really is wild. And the audience is doing that too. So it's this insane energy. It's overwhelming, the, the, the emotion that people bring to the show because, you know, you attach your own life to a show. I remember, you know, seeing Phantom and being like, oh, he's so tortured, and he writes songs, he likes that right. girl, she doesn't like him, that's me. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I meet people who go, I was, I'm the first in my family to go to college, and I had a really rough time, and this saved me. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not kidding when they say that, and that's, um, it's, a, it's a really incredible place to be on the receiving end of that. Wonderful. Well, yeah. congratulations. Thanks. It's been an amazing run. Thanks. Thanks for letting me do this interview with my shoes off. I'm much <laughs> more secret. relaxed. Secret yeah. revealed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching. See you next week.